This is episode number 12, uh, Pets of the History of Podcast. I'm Robert. And I'm Emma. And like Robert said, we are talking about the history of pets today. Now, before we dive right in, like we usually do, I'm going to promote the YouTube channel. YouTube so, channel. YouTube channel is the same name as our podcast, The History of. We also have an Instagram. You should totally check it out. It's called The History of Podcasts, and I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, we're growing. We're growing. We are, yeah. Um, of course, as always, first, we have the egg carton count. Today's egg carton count is 16. So we're, we're growing. It's, we are. It's doing well. We're getting more eggs. And, uh, okay, first thing I want to ask in this episode is... What do you? What are your opinions of pigs as pets? Pigs as pets? Well, I think when they're like baby little piglets, I think they're so adorable. And, you know, I think they're super cute. When they get bigger, however, they're not as cute. And I think they could be kind of dangerous. So definitely, definitely a threat to some extent. But I think they're still kind of cute. They, yeah, I've heard of people who like like when they get really big like people have died from their pet pigs Ooh. like they turn on them that's not good yeah it, it's it's it i mean i guess i can understand some situations that's a happy start to our episode feels kind of weird though and like pet pigs always have these sarcastic pun names like i've, I've seen chris middle initial p bacon chris p bacon chris p bacon um and peter porker <laughs> um yeah that's that's pigs, so you can have whatever opinion on that. I read I read a really good book this uh, earlier this summer called Inside of a Dog. Mm. Um, it's not quite about the history of pets. It talks about it a little bit, but it does help give the reader a better understanding of the world from a dog's perspective, which, of course, is, you know, still somewhat speculative. Of course. Well, here's something that will surprise you, or I think it will anyway. The most popular pet in the U.S. is not the dog. The number one most popular pet by number is actually fish. Cats come in at second and dogs are actually at third. Also, did you know that there are over twice as many dogs and cats in the U.S. than children? That's not right. That's, that's a lot. I think the reason fish is number one is because you're more likely to have a tank of 20 fish than you are to have 20 dogs. Right. Because, like, they're the smallest low-maintenance animals. Yeah. Plus, you don't want fish to get lonely. I mean, imagine being one fish just yeah, I know. swimming around. You want them to have a buddy. Even though that's fairly common. Okay. <laughs> uh, history. History of pets. People have been using horses and camels for thousands of years, but they're not pets like we would think of, you know, in the word today. Those animals were more vehicles or machines for all practical purposes. And didn't have that intimate human-animal relationship. I will say, uh, pets kind of are a selfish thing. I mean, we keep animals in our homes uh, so they can entertain us. When we pretend that they think the same way we do, we kind of anthropomorphize them. Uh, we, you know, pretend that they have human thoughts, even though they think completely differently. That's uh, that's discussed in that book, um, Inside of a Dog, that I mentioned earlier. And if you feel bad about, like, you know assigning human thoughts to your pet please like don't don't feel bad it's it's entertaining to do but just like <laughs> don't don't release your pet into the wild if you feel bad about that because it is our dog is definitely not ready for that oh no she's scared of her own nails walking across a wood floor i will say like just please all i ask is that you don't go extreme on like giving your dog a bath every day or like pushing it around in a stroller because that's like insulting to the animal like have have a bit of respect for the fact that it is an animal that's all i'm gonna say on that well duly noted dogs have also been domesticated for thousands of years but were probably more helpers than fur babies for most of the time think along the lines of slug dogs or hunting dogs in the old kingdom of ancient egypt People managed to tame, ready, geese, monkeys, hyenas, and even lions. However, it wasn't until 1600 BC in the New Kingdom of Egypt that cats were domesticated. I guess the reason it wasn't until later that cats were, like, cats aren't that useful. Like, they're more, 
They're more into. I feel like the cat sees us as a pet. Bro, you're about to make some cat people mad. I mean, pets. Like the whole purpose, the whole thing about pets is that they're not. Well, well, I'm jumping ahead, but yeah, I think the reason cats came later is because they're not. It wasn't useful like like the other animals might have been. Nevertheless, the Egyptians loved cats. They even went to the point of worshiping cats. Yeah, it was it was a little extreme. One thing that does come to mind, um, and you know, the point after right after this, uh, we'll have to do with it, is the overly familiar Sunday school story of the little lamb that wandered away from the shepherd. So the shepherd breaks its leg uh, and carries the lamb around his shoulders until it learns to stay near him. That vaguely reminds me of you know, like the lamb is kind of like a pet. Um, and it might be related to the Oxford English Dictionary's first reference uh, for the word pet, uh, and that uh, that was in the 1500s, I believe, and that is uh, a baby lamb raised by hand. We could make the argument that this dictionary entry was the beginning of pethood as we know it, but I think the evolution of animal domestication to household companions was a much more gradual process. It kind of creeped up on us without knowing it, like in a good way. Yeah. In a good way. So, to pinpoint the beginning of pets, we must define what makes them different from those other animals that are just sources of income, livestock, or even assistance. The answer is, pets directly serve no functional purpose whatsoever. And that's, that's kind of what I alluded to earlier. And, you know, some people have their emotional support animals. Service dogs, uh, also. But service dogs, they're not really pets. They're more I mean, assistance, really. Yeah, they're assistance. But, you know, emotional support animals. So I guess that's more of a functional purpose. Um, and I think how the people of a country treat and think about animals says something about the economy on a grand scale. Um, I wasn't able to find a direct correlation between uh, the GDP per capita and the ownership of pets. I'm still sticking to it, though. And I said grand scale a moment ago because I think as, you know, the human race as a whole, got more comfortable having technology over the course of hundreds, over the course of thousands of years, um, our attitude changed about having animals in our homes, like inside our homes, and being comfortable with that. Now we have to understand that household pets are genetically different from wild animals. There's this guy named Dmitry Belyev. Belyev, yeah, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. He's a geneticist in Russia, and in 1959, he conducted an experiment. It was more of a project, really, with some silver foxes from Siberia. Uh, the goal was to completely domesticate these wild foxes. He started with 130 foxes and bred together the ones that would be considered the most tame. He kept repeating this process over the years, breeding together the most tame of his silver foxes. About 40 years later, about 75% of his fox population had reached a level known as the domesticated elite. In other words, they acted like and were just as friendly as small house dogs. So if you can imagine a fox, that would act just like a small dog. Oh, that's so cute. So if you want to know how long it takes to make a wild species of pet, about 40 years, probably longer for something like a tiger or a gorilla. Did you know that Napoleon had a dog? Really? Yeah, he, like, I'm pretty sure it bit his ankle on, yeah, and, like, left a scar. It oh. was, yeah, it was rough. That's not good. Did you know that Charles Dickens had a dog, too? Really? Yeah, his name was Timberdoodle, and he had a severe case of fleas. Now, to combat this problem, Dickens had the poor thing shaved bald from head to paw. He said Timberdoodle looked like the ghost of a drowned dog come out of a pond after a week or so. Then, when his hair grew back, the fleas came back. So sad. Mm, okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about pets in America. <laughs> the Humane Society of the United States, uh, HSUS, com commonly referred to as the Humane Society, got started in 1954 by some people from the American Humane Society, which was a completely different uh, organization. The American Humane Society was a government organization, and the HSUS is non-government uh, affiliated. And my understanding as to why a new organization was created is that being non-government affiliated, the US H HSUS uh, would be able to accomplish more. And I respect that. 
Um, they gather money to fight animal cruelty, uh, train animal control professionals. Um, they also do things regarding, you know, meat processing and all that stuff. There is also the ASPCA, which stands for the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. They're a fairly similar organization, and that's where you get all those ads on TV that make you want to change the channel because you're going to cry, and it, those are hard to watch. I guess they it work. They yeah. work, but like... You're, you're making me change the channel. Like, this is going a little far. They're getting the point across, man. Yeah, well, I don't want to end on a sad note. So let's talk about something a little more upbeat, like veterinary medicine. All right. It's actually been around for as long as people have been using or domesticating animals, um, you know, because we need to keep them alive. That's However, the first college for veterinary medicine was established in 1762 by a man named Claude Bourgelat. Uh, and at this point in time, uh, and for about the next 300 years, veterinary medicine was pretty much primarily gauged towards livestock, uh, especially horses, uh, because, you know, horses were our vehicles before cars. Small animal veterinary medicine is actually fairly recent. Now, I, much say, I will say it's a little different than large animal, and sometimes in small animal medicine, things can get a little nitpicky. Well, there's the, the trivial stuff, like regular shots and things like that. But then sometimes, you know, people bring in their 15-year-old poodle for a double hip replacement, which costs about $11,000 when the dog is about to die. And it's, it's just sad stuff like that, you know what I mean? Anyway, the rise of small animal veterinary work really boosted the ownership of pets. Some credit the start of modern small animal veterinary medicine to a woman named Maria Dickin. She founded the PDSA, People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, in 1917. She had absolutely no prior experience working with animals, but she felt she needed to help. The organization, uh, the PDSA, grew fast with more patients, more staff, and more locations. To fuel the growth, uh, pets grew in popularity uh, during and after the two world wars. We talked about uh, this with, it was a similar thing with ice cream. You know, pets were kind of a comfort thing. While a majority of the staff of the PDSA were not formally trained, it was technically not illegal because they were only doing, quote, animal care, not veterinary surgery. This caused the organization to be looked down upon by the rest of the field because of its loopholes around legalities. This is not to mention the fact that the profession of pet care was thought of as petty. Nevertheless, uh, the veterinary community eventually embraced the small animal subdivision with the foundation of the British Small Animal Veterinary Association in 1957. And that is the rise of modern pet care. Of course, things have only expanded with advances in technology like x-ray, ultrasound, and pharmaceuticals for animals. Whether you're a dog, cat, fish, bird, lizard, pig, or fur baby person, all pet owners can agree that some animals just hold a special place in our hearts. Outside of a dog, the history of 365 at gmail.com is man's best friend. But inside of a dog, it's too dark to send an email without a backlit display. On More seriously, guys, if you have any questions, comments, or topics uh, you'd like to see in the future, please contact us at the history of 365 at gmail.com. Have a blessed day, and you've got to promise me something. Never stop learning.